Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name's Anna Chapman. I'm one of the directors of the Centre for Employment and Labor Relations Law here in the Law School. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the uh, University of Melbourne and the Law School this afternoon. Um, Justice Ian Ross is going to say a few words about the lecture series and then introduce our speaker um, for today. As you'd be aware, Justice Ross is the president of the Fair Work Commission. Um, his previous position directly before that was as president of VCAT. Um, in an earlier time, he was vice president of the Australian Industrial Relations Commission for almost 12 years. Um, prior to going to the bench, Dr Ross was a partner with Cause Chambers Westgarth um, at an, and at an earlier time was actually the legal officer and then the assistant secretary of the ACTU. Um, you might not be aware that uh, Justice Rolls Ross holds a Master's of Law degree, an MBA, and also a PhD in Law. And in 2005, uh, Dr Ross was made an Officer of the Order of Australia for Services to Industrial Relations. So I'll hand over to Justice Ross. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, and welcome to the first in the Workplace Relations Lecture Series. Um, the idea grew out of a broader uh, engagement strategy um, within the Commission that was one of the initiatives outlined uh, in our Future Directions paper released last year. And the idea is to both engage with um, uh, academia, with um, business and unions in a much broader way uh, than, uh, uh, than we have to date. And the idea behind this lecture series was really prompted by uh, Bridget and her return uh, to Australia. And I was contacted by ACAS advising me uh, that Bridget would be uh, in Australia uh, around this time. And because of her heavy involvement uh, in the WERS project as a team leader um, for that project within ACAS, she'd be ideally placed to uh, give us some information about the most recent results uh, arising from WERS. I think they were released in January this year. Uh, we're hoping that we will run uh, three or four of these in collaboration uh, with the University of Melbourne. Uh, the next one uh, is scheduled to be on the 24th of May uh, with uh, Professor Mark Bray talking around uh, employee engagement uh, generally. Uh, following this lecture, you'll receive an email uh, survey form seeking your feedback on both uh, this uh, initiative and more broadly uh, suggestions that you might have for future topics. We think it's an opportunity for um, researchers in our field uh, to present broadly to the industrial relations community and uh, hopefully to provide some interesting insights uh, into the work that we're all engaged in. Um, I'd like to, before um, inviting Bridget to address us, uh, I'd like to particularly thank uh, Anna and uh, uh, John Howe uh, within the centre for all the assistance uh, that they've provided in making uh, this possible. Uh, Senior Deputy President uh, Jennifer Acton, who is a, both on the centre and obviously a member of the tribunal, and Kate Purcell within uh, the Commission for all the work uh, that she's done in making sure that I've arrived on time. Um, and look, with those uh, short observations, uh, I'd invite um, uh, Bridget to address us on uh, the WERS survey and its uh, relationship to Australia and the prospects for an Australian study. Um, thanks very much, Ian, and thanks very much for having me. Um, it's really an honour to be back in Australia and to be doing the first seminar in this series. Okay, so I was um, given quite a comprehensive remit of what my talk should cover today, so I'm going to try my best to at least touch on the areas, um, and there will always be time for questions at the end, I'm hoping. so. Um, so first I'm going to provide some background to the British Workplace Employment Relations Study, why it's done, its benefits and how such a massive undertaking is established. I will then explain the research design of the 2011 words and some of the strengths and limitations of such a design. 
I was asked to focus on productivity, flexibility and business performance indicators. So I will mention how these are measured in words and then discuss some of the first findings from the 2011 study in these and a few other areas. So WERS is not unique to Britain. Indeed, it has been re replicated in many countries um, and France just conducted their equivalent called RESPONSE in 2011 as well. Australia's equivalent, um, AWERS, was conducted in 1990 and 95. So I'll try to compare the two series and raise some issues that could be considered for a potential AWERS in the future. So what is WERS? The Workplace Employment Relations Study is a survey that maps the state of employment relations in Britain with workpla um, of workplaces with five or more employees. WERS is an ongoing study. The 2011 WERS is the sixth in a series that began in 1980 and the previous one was in 2004. There really is no other study like it in the world in terms of its size but also its comprehensiveness. It is unique in that it obtains three different perspectives of employment relations in the workplace, from managers, employee representatives and employees themselves. This provides a rounded perspective of what is happening inside the workplace. The study is renowned internationally for its rigour, not only in terms of, of its size and scope, but also its data quality. WORS has traditionally had very good response rates, however we have seen a decline in the last two studies in line with general trends in response to social and business surveys more generally. In 2004 the response rate for the manager survey was 64% and in 2011 it was 46%. So WORS is not a government study. It has multiple funding sources, both government and non-government organisations. So this ensures there's not one organisation pushing their agenda. Rather, it's in the interests of all funding bodies that it is um, impartial and rigorous. WERS has a national and inter international reputation for providing good quality and rich data on British employment relations. It is widely endorsed by a range of employer, employee and industry organisations. So WERS has three main aims, which have essentially remained the same since the beginning. WERS gives a comprehensive picture of the current state of employment relations in Britain. Be because WERS has been ongoing since 1980, we are able to map many aspects of employment relations over time to see what changes have been occurring. WERS provides current data to inform policy and debate about employment relations issues. It is used by policymakers and pr practitioners across government, advocacy organisations and within indus industry. The WERS data set is made publicly available so anyone who wants to use it can. So WERS is val valuable to both policymakers and practitioners in the employment relations field. Employers and, and particularly employer and employee organisations use WERS to inform their own policies and practice. During the consultation phase for this um, 2011 WERS, I discovered that it's widely used by both the Confederation of Business and Industry in the UK, CBI, and the TUC for their policy submissions. And during some communications research with potential respondents, we found employers would like to use it so they can benchmark themselves against other workplaces. What WERS is widely used among academic researchers to examine the broad area of what works at work. However, use is not just confined to the employment relations field. It's also used in other dis disciplines such as organisational psychology and economics. A vast array of issues have been explored using WERS, including high-performing workplaces, employee voice and engagement, job satisfaction and work-life balance, just to name a few. The work that academics do also feeds into government policy and development. So WERS is really valuable to government. It's used to inform decisions about policy. WERS is sponsored by a range of government departments and agencies because the data is important to them. But it's also useful to other agencies, such as the Low Pay Commission, who have used it to in for information about pay distrib distribution inside the workplace that can't be provided by official statistics. 
For the Labor Markets Di Directory in the Department of Business, it is one of their key data sources, feeding into policy impact assessments on a range of policy areas, including TUPE, collective redundancies, unions and flexible working. So here on the slide, I've um, listed some examples of policies that the 2004 data fed into, but also some policies that I know the most recent data has fed into or will feed into. WERS is not only an important um, has WERS doesn't only have an important role in um, policy development, but also in policy debates within the academic community. I think a good example of this is the issue of whether high involvement management practices make more profitable and productive workplaces. This is an issue that occupies both academia and government through the employment, employee engagement agenda and something WERS continues to shed light on. So as I mentioned, WERS is co-sponsored. The six sponsors are the Department of Business, Innovation and Skills, the Economic, Social and Re Research Council, where I come from, ACAS, which is, uh, stands for the Advisory Conciliation Arbitration Service, um, the Health and Safety Executive, the UK Commission for Employment Skills, and a research organisation called the National Institute for Economic and Social Research, NISA. The sponsors have contributed in a variety of ways from personnel to funding contributions. NISA's participation Participation has been made possible by way of a research grant from the Nuffield Foundation and this grant has been obtained for the production of the WERS book. All six sponsors have a place, sometimes two, on the WERS steering committee that oversee the project and a representative from the Department of Business chairs the committee. A memorandum of agreement was established at conception which outlined some of the governance issues as well as details of the project. As project leader, I have a lot of day-to-day -day autonomy. I lead a research team of seven that are made up of researchers from the funding organisations. We make decisions together about the analytical direction of the project. In terms of substantial decisions about budgets or changes in the research design or plans for dissemination, I present options and recommendations to the steering committee for a final decision. So I haven't found this to be a fraught process and I think a major reason for this is that we have a lot of guidance from precedent in terms of the last survey in 2004 and the previous surveys. Also of help to this is that our members of the steering committee have also been involved in previous wars. So often decisions are guided about what had or hadn't worked in previous studies. So just to, for an example of this, um, let's take the questionnaire design of how this works. So an important goal of the questionnaire design this time round was to reduce the length of the interviews in the hope of improving response to the survey. However, in doing this, the main priority was to keep the questionnaires aligned to the 2004 instruments as much as possible to ensure continuity of measurements and maintain the time series. However, in doing so, it's also important that we capture any new phenomena that has appeared in workplaces. To assist these decisions, a consultation was conducted. It was split into two parts where we consulted with academic users of the data and then more policy-oriented users of the data. We combined these two parts of the consultation to produce a report, which we presented this to the steering committee with a list of recommendations. And then from there, they developed a list of questions to delete and priorities for new questions. So let's now just look at the actual structure of the research design. So as I said, WERS is unique in that it goes into the workplace and it collects information from the three sources of managers, employees and the representatives. In previous studies, we had a separate longitudinal element where we would contact workplaces who participated in the last survey and ask the manager to undertake a shortened version of the questionnaire to quickly assess if and how things had changed from the last time we were at the workplace. However, in 2011, in order to reduce costs, we have integrated a group of workplaces who participated in the last survey into the main study. So that means um, we have two, the sample for the study is made up of two groups, those who were studied, uh, who were visited in 2004 
and we collected uh, information from 989 of those workplaces and then the fresh sample of workplaces who were not, um, where we achieved almost 1,700 interviews with these workplaces. So this results in a combined sample size of 2,680 management interviews for 2011. The advantage of this change is that we now also collect longitudinal data from employees and worker representatives, adding to the richness of the data. So the interview with the manager comprises of two questionnaires as well as the main face-to-face -face interview. In this interview, we determine whether there are any representatives at the workplace and if there are, we undertake an um, interview with one union and one non-union representative. And then a questionnaire is distributed up to 25 employees who are randomly selected from the workplace. And where the workplace has 25 or less employees, we give a questionnaire to everyone. So there are five instruments in WORS. The employee profile questionnaire is given to the manager before their face-to-face -face interview. And this collects um, information about the composition of the workplace, such as the age of employees, wage levels, ethnicity and the occupations at the workplace. And after the face-to-face -face interview with the manager, we distribute a financial performance questionnaire. And this is used to determine the productivity and profitability of the workplace. And I was pleased as I was doing a little bit of research for this um, talk today that um, the survey of employees which was introduced into the British Wars in 1998 was actually inspired by the 1995 Australian Wars. WERS continues to evolve over time, so for this one we made the self-completion questionnaires available online and we also provided the survey of employees in um, six different um, languages as well. So here I've provided a list of the topics covered by WERS. I've tried to list them all and mention a few that are covered by the survey of employees and the worker representative interview. Um, but it's possible that I've missed some. But as you can see, the data we collect is extensive. So what are the strengths and limitations of such a complex research design? Well, with, as with most things, um, an aspect that can be a strength can also bring lim limitations. But I think overall the greatest strength of WORS is the multidimensional perspective for a number of reasons. You aren't relying on just one account, say the managers, of what is happening at the workplace. Um, we can gain an understanding of the very, various actors in a complex employment relationship at the workplace. And by collecting other perspectives, say the financial employee perspectives, you can more effectively evaluate the outcomes of management practices. Related to this is its other strength, the depth and breadth of the information collected. As I've demonstrated, WORS collects data on a vast array of aspects of the employment relationship, which enables a comprehensive understanding of employment <coughs> practices and the ability to determine the links between practices and outcomes. The downside of this is that it's quite a burden on the management respondent, and we are relying on them to know a lot about what happens at that workplace. WORS is a quantitative survey, and sometimes we are trying to capture something that a relationship which may be more suitable for qualitative methods. However, I believe it's vital for effective policy making to understand the landscape you are trying to change. And for this, you need representative information of the workplace population. It has been argued that the British WORS has crowded out case study research on employment relations, but this has been discounted by a review of published research in academic journals. So the beauty of WORS is that it takes a step inside the workplace to understand what is actually happening. It doesn't rely on reports from the head of office's office about what policies they have in place, but instead goes direct to the source to understand how policy, policies have been interpreted, adapted or even ignored, and instead what is actually occurring. 
The difficulty of this approach is that with large organisations, such as large supermarket chains, up to 40 workplaces can be selected to participate in the survey in Britain. And, that's, and this can be off-putting for their head offices, but there are always ways of managing this. Also, a particular challenge we found this time around is that increasingly the HR function is being outsourced to HR business partners. So determining who is the right person to speak to and whether they are loca located in um, the workplace or not is tricky. In dealing with an analysts and policy makers at the Department of Business, I've always been careful to stress that WORS is not a policy evaluation tool. And it's not. If it were, it would be constantly changing to reflect the latest policies and laws, thereby losing its ability to map practices over time. However, the strength of mapping is that we're able to determine whether practices are changing and, we're, and we are able to draw links with not only changes in government policy, but also the economic and social environment. So there's particular interest in how WERS measures productivity, competitiveness and flexibility. And I'm not surprised as these are very tricky things to measure. These concepts can often be defined and measured in a whole range of ways and therefore there's not always agreement on the best way to me measure them. This slide just lists some of the ways WERS attempts to measure these concepts across the different instruments. WERS relies on a combination of subjective measures and, where possible, collects ob objective measures as well. If subjective measures have to be solely relied on, it's best if we can gather them from a variety of sources so we're not just relying on one or two pieces of data. The objective measures are obtained from the financial performance questionnaire. However, the public sector is omitted from this and workplaces are generally less willing to participate in this element of the study. However, across the study, there are a variety of ways these important aspects of workplaces can be measured and used to determine how employment practices contribute to the health of a business. So, um, as Ian said, we've um, recently produced our first publication from the 2000 words, and this is the first findings report. Um, the aim of the report is to produce the first cut of the data and some of the headline findings that have come out of the study. In doing this, we compare the results to the last words, which was conducted in 2004, to determine if any changes occurred. The publication is used by policy makers and academics alike to find out what words has to tell us about the current state of employment relations in Britain. I'm going to provide you with some of the glimpses of the first findings. Um, so the first area is workforce flexibility. This can be divided into two broad areas. One is flexibility in the way labour is used at the workplace and the other is flexibility, flexibility in employees' working arrangements. So uh, this table here shows the different ways labour is used or deployed within a workplace. It shows the proportion of workplaces that have at least one person in the workplace on the stated arrangement. So there's been little change between 2004 and 11 in the proportion of workplaces using part-time work, fixed term or temporary contracts, agency workers or co contracting services in or out. More workplaces were making some use of non-standard working hours arrangements in 2011, that is shift work, annualised hours and zero hours contracts, although for the latter two, uh, use is still relatively low. The sizeable increase in the use of shift working was largely something that happened in smaller workplaces, and so we don't expect this to have a large effect on the um, employee population as a whole. So after the 2008 financial crisis, the British economy entered a deep recession, contracting more than at any point since the depression of the 1930s, and now there is still no immediate sign of sustained recovery. However, despite this, employment levels have not suffered to the degree expected. Four, year la four, four years later, after the crisis, absolute employment levels have returned to pre-recessionary levels. So this begs the question, did employees change their employment practices to respond to the recession? 
Did employment relations play an important role? And was workforce flexibility the key to this outcome? The 2011 words capitalise on this unique environment by asking all three respondents about their particular experiences in the recession. So how broad were the effects and what did workplaces do to respond? Most workplaces reported being affected to some extent by the recession. Just 10% of workplace managers stated that the recession had no adverse effect on their workplace. The majority of workplaces had taken some action in response to the recession that impacted directly on their workforce. So just to show you in a little bit more detail, here we have the list of um, employment practices that uh, we surveyed managers about um, that they said they had done in response, directly in response to the recession. So the first, the top three in this slide um, show that around two-fifths of all workplaces instituted a wage freeze or wage cut. Around three in ten workplaces put a hold on filling vacant posts and around a quarter reorganised work among existing staff. So while wage freezes and the like are obviously bad news for workers, they may have helped avert even more um, worse outcomes. Only 14% of workplaces made compulsory redundancies and just 7% made voluntary redundancies. Public sector workplaces were more likely than those in the private sector to have experienced some form of response to the recession, perhaps indicating the role that state-owned workplaces have been asked to play in responding to the broad economic crisis through the government's austerity agenda in the UK. The survey also asked workplace managers whether they felt their workplace was now weaker as a result of the recession. And a sizeable majority, 58%, said it wasn't. So a central aim of the forthcoming WORS book will be to examine what, which types of workplaces fared better through the recession and whether the approach to employment relations played any part in determining their experience. So now just turning to flexible working arrangements, we find <coughs> that there's been no general pattern of change in the adoption of these practices since 2004. Home working and compressed hours have increased, but on the other hand, um, the ability to reduce hours and job share has decreased. So to put a bit of context around these results, we find that there has been an increase in managers who say it's up to employees to balance their work and family responsibilities. This has increased from 66% in 2004 to 76% in 2011. So let's now take a look at the way pay is determined in Britain and the pay outcomes for 2011. If we're going to talk about pay determination, we need to mention trade unions and in particular the UK trade union recognition laws. If an employer does not voluntary, voluntarily agree to recognise a union for negotiating pay and conditions, the union can seek statutory recognition as long as they fulfil a number of requirements, the main one being that at least 10% of their employees are members at the workplace. While we know about the slow downward trend in union membership from official statistics, what words can tell us is about union presence and membership inside a workplace. Overall, WORS has found stability in the presence of unions at the workplace but continuing decline in small private sector workplaces. So this chart shows that a little bit. So the first half of this chart shows that workplaces with at least one union member at the workplace dropped six percentage points to 23% in 2011. However, there was not a statistically, statistically significant decline in the proportion of workplaces that recognised trade unions for negotiating paying conditions. Because um, any decline in union re recognition has primarily occurred in the small private sector workplaces, it means that the proportion of employees located in a workplace that recognises union has not changed at all, remaining at 46% um, in 2011, which is shown in the final two bars of this chart. So just over a quarter of these unionised workplaces have a lay representative located at the workplace, and again this hasn't changed since 2004. So when a union is recognised at the workplace, what kind of influence do they have over pay and conditions? 
While collective bargaining has remained at a low level in the private sector, it has declined noticeably in the public sector. This table shows that collective bargaining takes place in 6% of private sector workplaces. And in the public sector, on the other hand, 70% of workplaces had some collective bargaining in 2004, and this decreased to 58% in 2011. This means that less than half of public sector employees are now covered by collective bargaining, a drop from 69% in 2004. Among the research team, we suspect that there could be a number of reasons for this. It may be accounted for by the reintroduction of pay review bodies, in particular the NHS independent pay review body, but even when we account for this by excluding the health sector from the statistics, we still find that collective bargaining coverage has dropped from 66 to 56 per cent of public sector employees. Alternatively, we also know that the public sector has just passed its third year and for some its fourth year of a pay freeze. It's possible that the absence of negotiation over pay has been translated into a decline in collective bargaining in the statistics. It is these types of issues that we'll be further exploring in the book. Um, and this suspicion is further supported by the finding that the proportion of public sector workplaces reporting annual pay reviews has declined from 92 to 83% in 2011 while in the private sector has remained stable at 91% of workplaces. So where a review has been undertaken, there has been an increase in an outcome of a pay freeze. There has been, uh, this has doubled in private sector workplaces and more than half of public sector workplaces reported this outcome. However, we still find that unions are having a positive effect on pay settlements. Where a union was present, there was a greater likelihood that the settlement resulted in a pay increase, more so in the public sector where collective bargaining is more common. <coughs> so employee engagement, it's something that I've only really become familiar with during my time in the UK. Um, it's something that has occupied both academics and government. In 2009, the previous Labor government commissioned the McLeod Report called Engaging for its Success. The report demonstrates the benefits to business in engaging their employees, not just in their immediate jobs, but in the wider workplace. And it sets out the four pillars of engagement, of leadership, trust and integrity, line management skills, and an organisational narrative. WERS does a pretty good job in measuring all four of these aspects. However, I'm just going to concentrate on a few select findings that are covered in the first findings report. So what we find is that managers are making, um, more managers are making the effort to share information through workplace meetings, team briefings and sharing finan financial information about the workplace. However, in terms of going beyond the basic information sharing and communicating, to more actively engaging employees, for example, by conducting st staff surveys or establish establishing problem-solving groups inside the workplace, there's been no change in employees' employees' practices. Further, we find that active consultation, whereby managers respond to employees' suggestions and allow them to influence decision making, was also less common than information sharing. So that's demonstrated by this chart here. So here we find that half, less than half of employees felt that managers are very good or good at responding to suggestions from employees or their reps. And even fewer, one third of employees, thought that managers are good at allowing them to influence decisions. However, there have been slight increases since 2004 in the proportion of employees rating managers as very good or good across all of these three consultation measures. So despite the relatively low levels of active consultation, we find that more employees are committed to the organisation they work in. WERS uses three measures to explore employees' organisational commitment. They are whether employees share the values of their organisation, feel loyal to their organisation, and are proud to say who they work for. This chart shows the periods 2004 and 11 there have been notable increases across all three measures. 
If we look at the last two bars here, you can see that in 2004, 60% of employees said they were proud to tell people who they work for, and this rose to 68% in 2011. So here is yet another aspect that requires further exploration. Are these results due to employees changing their expectations in a more difficult economic environment? Or does it reflect changes in the way people are being managed? Has this higher level of commitment resulted in better outcomes for workplaces? So in the last 30 years in the UK, um, just as in Australia, we've seen a dramatic fall in the level of collective workplace conflict. Documented by the drop in days lost to stoppages and a rise in individual disputes, evidenced by the increased employ employment tribunal claims. However, trade union resistance in the public sector against the government's austerity measures has seen a small spike in the number of strikes in 2011. While official statistics report the days lost to stoppages, WERS reports on the workplaces affected by strikes and other forms of industrial action. The proportion of workplaces in which a strike took place rose from 1% in 2004 to 4% in 2011. This is a result of the quadrupling of strikes in the public sector workplaces from 6 to 27% in 2011. Other forms of industrial action, such as overtime bans and threats, remained stable over the period. So generally, normally, to gauge the level of individual disputes, we have to rely on employment tribunal statistics, which is restricted, restricted to disputes that have been formally escalated. But in WERS, we can record disputes that have been formally raised within the workplace. In terms of disputes between individual employees and the employer, workplaces that had disciplinary action and dismissals take place remain stable. However, the proportion of workplaces where an employee raised a grievance declined from 38% in 2004 to 30% in 2011. Again, a possible explanation for this could, could be changed in expectations within a, within a difficult economic environment and the high levels of unemployment. In terms of how workplaces handle these individual disputes, in excess of 80% have procedures for dealing with employee grievances and discipline and dismissals, and procedures are more prevalent in larger workplaces, which means that the majority of employees, 96% or more, are covered by them. So this table shows the results for procedures with dealing with collective, um, collective and the two groups of individual disputes. You can see that collective dispute procedures are not as common, but obviously you don't need a procedure for something that doesn't occur. That is, it, where there's not a union at the workplace. So for workplaces that have a recognised union, almost three quarters have a collective disputes procedure in place. Okay, so when I left Australia at the end of 2009, there was a lot of murmuring among my peers about conducting another AWERS. And it's heartening to see that this hasn't died down and has possibly spread a little bit further. So I've been asked to comment on the differences between the British WERS and AWERS. So in looking at the AWERS data items on the Australian Social Science Data Archives, I would have to say that it appears to be very much, AWERS appears to be a very much an industrial relations survey, with many items focused on union activity. This, of course, could be a sign of the times, and I haven't gone back to the equivalent WERS surveys of that period to see whether that's the case. But I hope I've demonstrated that the British WERS maps a wide range of employment practices. This IR focus in AWERS makes it obvious as to why they felt it necessary to have two separate surveys, one for workplaces with 20 or more employees and one for workplaces with 5 to 19 employees. That said, as I noted, noted before, AWERS was the first to introduce the employee survey, which I think is critical to the evaluative power of the study. The other differences I noted was separate management and employee relations surveys. So I think this is a clever way of overcoming the issue I mentioned before in that the breadth, 
breadth of the survey requires the management respondent to know a lot about what's going inside the what's happening inside the workplace. It's worth mentioning also that my colleagues, uh, my ex colleagues at the Workplace Research Centre at the University of Sydney. Um, conducted their Eastern Board series in Queensland, New South Wales and Victoria in the mid-2000s. However, these surveys were much more limited in scope, focusing on pay determin determin determination arrangements and gathered information at the organisational level. So, if another AWERS was on the cards, what would we need to consider? Well, at the risk of sounding obvious, I think it's uh, a lot of time needs to be spent on thinking about what the core objectives of the study would be. I think the key to the success and longevity of the British WERS is that it doesn't seem to have ever got up with the particular fads or policy objectives of the day. The enduring aim to map employment relations over time has created a valuable tool for making evidence-based policy, as well as informing the wider debates. The breadth of the study means that the chance of capturing data on issues that come into the spotlight over the time is high. And the time series element is critical in understanding change and the influence of both policy and the ec economic environment. So I'm advocating an enduring AWERS series that has a wide breadth that covers a suite of employment practices. That's the high level considerations, of course, but there are other considerations at the design level and a more practical fieldwork level that can only be dealt with once the objectives of the research have been agreed. So I hope I've gone some way to demonstrating the benefits for such a study, in particular, the important role it can play in evidence-based policy making. In terms of the future for the British words, all the focus is on making the most of the 2011 words and making the most of such a rich resource. So I've mentioned a couple of times the upcoming book, the focus of which will be on employment relations in the period of 2004 to 2011 and the role it played in the recession. The data will be soon available from the UK data archives and the sponsors will be doing what they can to encourage its use. I've been asked about um, the future or the possible future of a seventh WERS. To tell you the truth, um, all the focus has been on this WERS. However, I have been putting in place succession planning to ensure that we can learn as much as possible from the 2011 experience. As project manager of the sixth WERS, I would have to say that the two biggest challenges I faced were around the workplace as a unit of analysis and fighting declining response rates. We learnt some difficult lessons around getting head office agreement for multiple workplaces to participate in the study and around the HR business, par um, business partner model. So things to think about for a future words is how can the structure of the survey, how can we structure the survey to make it more amenable to manager participation? Should we consider collecting the data from several sources at the workplace or even at an organisational level? But despite the challenges, we have ended up with an extremely valuable resource that has almost infinite potential for analysis. So if you are after any further information, there are basically two main sources where you can get it. Um, the first is the BizWords webpage at the gov.uk website. So I've put the address here. Um, I believe the slides are going to be um, circulated, yep. Um, and that's the address where you can download a copy of the first findings report if you wish. And the second, of course, is the UK data archive from where the data will be available for analysis from about March. Also, again, just um, it's obligatory that I put in another plug for our book that will be published in November this year. <laughs>